It has been my privilege to have been associated with the tremendous organization, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, who had the prescience to begin a program in cosmology, recognizing that these uh, questions that we ask of the universe are questions that can, in fact, be answered. And uh, for three decades, one's seen um, transformation after transformation of the subject, and um, our program has evolved accordingly. Uh, never more so for discoveries than this past five-year period of the program, which is what we're mostly focusing on today. The universe, as we look around us here in this room on the Earth, the galaxy, and out into the many galaxies that we see uh, around us, looks very complex. And it is very complex. The thing that we've learned is that the beginnings of all of that are tremendously simple. And I'm going to try and explain to you how we learned about that simplicity and how that simplicity has evolved uh, into complexity. What is the driving force for that? It is the force of gravity. It naturally happens that one evolves from simplicity to complexity. If we look to the extremely large future of the universe, right at the moment, our best bet is that it will go to a state of extreme simplicity once again. And then we are also trying to look at the earliest moments of time and our belief is that it, that also is extremely complex. So the complex equation I'm putting to you now is we go from complex to simple to complex to simple, a very interesting uh, philosophical view of the universe. Uh, one of the nuggets that we have learned over these three decades, and uh, mainly within the past uh, uh, two decades, is um, that the universe is uh, made up of not just the ordinary matter that you know and love, that you're made of, that the air is made of, etc., but the galaxy um, exists in the form that it does and is being held together predominantly by this mysterious entity called dark matter. We call it dark matter because it is not apparently radiating although it might interact somewhat, that's very important for us. Uh, but you can also think of dark in the sense of mysterious, and it is truly dark matter, it is mysterious, and we don't know what it is right now, although we're trying to find it. But it has an amount which is about six times that, on average in the universe, of the ordinary matter, or five times. Uh, lest you think that this is only something that is going on way out there, way beyond, we think that our best bets for the dark matter, that it's here with us in this room, passing through you as we speak with a speed of about 200 kilometers per second, and very, very, very rarely, it's interacting with you, and so you are yourselves detectors of dark matter. Uh, among the best bets for the dark matter is that there would be, roughly speaking, one every 20 centimeters or so. So it's got nothing similar to the density of ordinary matter in air. But if you go into uh, far space, then the dark matter dominates by uh, amounts that are of order uh, six to one. Uh, we discovered something else. We aren't very good at naming names, but we always use the word adjective dark. Dark energy. So dark matter holds the galaxy together. Dark matter has a different role to play, and it became uh, dominant at fairly late times as the universe uh, goes. And it causes the galaxies not just to move away from each other, but to actually accelerate away from each other and accelerate with um, uh, an increasing rate. And that is um, something, if it's completely true, allows us to forecast our far, far future, which is sort of like what people used to call a heat death, where we uh, in the galaxy will become quite isolated from all other galaxies. 
you don't have to worry. This is in the immortal phrase of, uh, of uh, Carl Sagan, billions and billions and billions of years downstream. And when I say billions, I mean very many billions. So this is the basic uh, simplicity of what makes up the universe. And then an issue is, how did all of the structure in the universe arise? And what we have learned again, and the story that I'm going to be telling you, is that, um, uh, that there are just a few parameters that we need to have measured in order to have understood how things are, uh, arose. We're going to begin at the Earth. You know uh, maps of the Earth, but I'm just showing you this to note that the North Pole's at the top, South Pole at the bottom, and this uh, two-dimensional map uh, joins around uh, to wrap around your head so that it's like a sphere, but it's two-dimensional representation. As we go out and look at the Milky Way, the Milky Way is a disk galaxy, um, and this is looking at it in the same way. The band in the center is, in fact, what we call the Milky Way. And uh, that's still only a spherical representation of the Milky Way. And a 3D representation, a 3D representation is given by this here, where these are the stars in spiral arms in the Milky Way disk of the galaxy. Here's the sun, and the dark matter extends in some great region all the way around that is much larger than the visible galaxy. That's what's holding it together. If we go out further, and this is not even too far from cosmic scales, this is the way the structure looks. These are all galaxies, each one of them, 60,000 of them, and they're all clustered together into various entities. Clusters up here, clusters of clusters here, filaments joining the clusters, and voids. So this is the structure, and as we go further and further out in the universe, we see that the galaxy patterns like this continue on and on as far as we can see, changing a bit, but as far as we can see. But there comes a time when the galaxies run out, before which there were no galaxies. But as has been referred to in the introduction, what comes to the rescue here is the remarkable discovery of the cosmic microwave background in 1965 and the detailed exploration of it. And so I've been uh, involved since 1993 with the Planck Space Telescope, which was uh, designed to look at those signals from the early moments of the universe, looking at this cosmic microwave background. So the launch, one of the great heartfelt occurrences in my life was to be at the launch in French Guiana and your heart is in your gullet or whatever uh, because all of those years of effort, 16 years, could have gone up if the launch was not successful. But it was successful and Planck has been one of the most successful of three major classes of satellites that we've seen. Um, the picture that we released in 2010 uh, was just a tantalizer showing the complex emissions of the Milky Way galaxy, which we've already talked about. Um, and behind it is the primordial light that we were after um, that was released 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, or 13.8 uh, billion years ago, uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So there are all of these emissions that we had to get rid of, and Sure enough, we did. In 2013, we released an image. This is actually the 2015 image. Um, and so we unveiled the sources. And these are uh, tiny little fluctuations in the intensity or equivalently temperature of the cosmic microwave background measured in micro Kelvin, so really tiny, requiring tremendous instrumentation. And Look at all of the structure that's associated with this on very large scales and on very small scales. And each one of those structures has associated with it characteristic wavelengths. And we analyze this by harmonic analysis, uh, much the same way that you analyze music. Um, I just wanted to quickly refer to um, the sequence of satellites that we've had looking at this radiation. Uh, one launched in 1989 called the COBE satellite, which got the Nobel Prize, but looked 
um, at very low resolution at the microwave background. An extremely successful satellite launched in 2001. Many people in the program, including me, worked on results from that. Uh, and then finally, this Planck satellite uh, with much higher resolution looking at all of these ups and downs. And we look at higher resolution beyond that from telescopes that we'll hear about later today on the ground. Instead of trying to show you the um, uh, details of how we analyze things, um, I am making the harmonic an analysis, uh, which is uh, uh, showing you the different components of the signal uh, separated into wavelengths, but mapped into just something that you're hearing. And so if you listen to it, It sounds sort of like noise, but it's clearly got structure. And the structures are associated with the various characteristic scales of this. And we can take that information and analyze it in detail. And what we learn are things, as I referred to, the different contents of the universe. The ordinary matter, the dark matter, and the dark energy. Three numbers. But we can do more than that. We can further unveil the signals um, and see what lies below that. And it's, this is a map of what lies below that. And we can characterize the structure in that map of the earliest moments of the universe by just two numbers. And those two numbers, it's a remarkable discovery. Who would have thought that? In terms of music, the basic and most powerful discovery of the Planck satellite is that the sound from the ultra early universe is like classical music. In classical music, unlike rock music, every octave is tried to use to maximum amount so that there are notes in every frequency. And the sound of the universe from these earliest moments are like that. Uh, we have discovered another fantastic uh, result from Planck is that there is a little more bass than treble, and the other feature is that it's noise-like. So those were all of the celebrated findings. There is one more thing that we are after. We have placed strong constraints with Planck and other experiments on this, but we're also after gravitational radiation from the early universe with this microwave background radiation, looking for the signals there. We'll hear about that this afternoon. It's an exciting frontier of our subject. OK, so now to end, uh, we have this universe, high degree of simplicity. And what happens if we fast forward with very large computers and take what we've learned about the earliest moments of the universe and the different kinds of matter that are present. And um, if we fast forward it and simulate, we find that we get a universe that looks exactly like ours. Uh, it has the characteristic clusters, the superclusters of clusters clustered together, filaments, et cetera, voids. And so the great result is that by having unveiled the simplicity of the universe and Taking that and moving forward with gravity, we have understood the um, overall aspect of the universe. And I will end there with a picture of a snake with a happy, smiley face looking back over all of cosmic time uh, and understanding everything, which is, of course, what we're trying to do. On the other hand, note that there's a big question mark. We certainly do not understand everything in this subject and are hard at work. Thank you.